Dear students, Assalamu alaikum. I welcome you to the third lecture of probability and stochastic processes. I am Dr. Muhammad Akmal Bhatt. Let's quickly review what we covered in previous two lectures. We started with basics of mathematics that we will need to analyze unpredictable events using probability theory. We started with sets and covered Venn diagram which is a graphical representation of sets. While talking about sets which are unordered collection of objects, we talked about vectors which are ordered collection of objects and the vectors came up in the discussion of Cartesian product which is pairs formed from two or more sets. While talking about sets, we talked about cardinality of a set. Cardinality is the number of elements in a set and for finite set, it is actually the number of elements in a set. But for infinite sets, we have to make a mathematically sound argument about the size of a set. We learned that set of natural numbers, set of integers and set of rational numbers all are infinite but they are countably infinite in a sense that their elements can be put in one to one correspondence with set of natural numbers. So these three sets are called countably infinite set. We also learned that the set of real number has more elements than the countably infinite set and that's the reason it's called uncountably infinite set. We also talked about power set. It is a set of sets. For a given set, its power set contains as its elements all possible subsets of the given set. We also discussed the cardinality of the power set and we talked about this fact that cardinality of power set of a set is always larger than the cardinality of the original set that we started with. For a finite set, the cardinality of the power set is 2 raised to power the cardinality of the original set. And for a countably infinite set, the cardinality of its power set is equivalent to the cardinality of uncountably infinite sets. The next thing we discussed was Cartesian product where pairs are formed by taking first element from one given set and second element from another given set. An important thing about Cartesian product is its cardinality. If the sets which are being used to form the Cartesian product are finite, then the Cartesian product has a cardinality which is equal to the product of cardinality of the two sets which are being used to form the Cartesian product. But what if the two sets used to form the Cartesian product are infinite themselves? For example, we can form Cartesian product between two sets which are countably infinite. Then we discuss that the cardinality of the Cartesian product of two countably infinite sets is also countably infinite. In other words, if we have a set of natural numbers n, we can rearrange its elements to make an infinite extent two-dimensional array. Actually, we can make a three-dimensional infinite extent array also from set of natural numbers. And we can extend this argument and say the cardinality of a finite dimensional discrete space is equal to the cardinality of countably infinite set n. In my last lecture, I asked you to find out what happens to the cardinality of the Cartesian product if the two sets are uncountably infinite. The answer is that the cardinality of the Cartesian product of to uncountably infinite sets is also uncountable. The proof is simple but not very obvious. Actually, it took George Cantor three years to come up with this proof. And you can look up a standard advanced level 
text on number theory to find this proof. So what we have now is basic information about sets, their cardinality and the Cartesian products. And the last thing we discussed was relations and functions which are subsets of Cartesian product. In Cartesian product, every possible pair is formed and relation is a subset of Cartesian product and a function is a still more restrictive subset of Cartesian product which maps each domain element to a range element where domain is a subset of the first set and the range is a subset of the second set. Let's continue with our discussion of functions. It is important to note that in functions the domain set and range set need not to be sets of numbers like set of integers, set of real numbers. They can be any sets and this will be clear if we look at this interesting example. In this example we have two sets A and B where set A is set of hockey playing countries which are going to participate in the next Olympic Games. Let's assume that there will be 16 teams that will participate in upcoming Beijing Olympics. And set B is a set of three medals, gold, silver and bronze. So if we use this set A, set of 16 hockey playing nations and set B as three medals, then the Cartesian product A into B is all pairs where first entry is team and second entry is medal. Then this Cartesian product will have 48 pairs which will have all possible combinations of teams and the medals they hope to get. And let's look at a function which will be a subset of this collection of 48 pairs. And this function will be from hockey playing nations to medals and this will be the result of Olympic Games. At the end, there will be three teams who will stand on the podium and they will form our domain set and the range set is three medals. So in the end, we will have a function, a subset of Cartesian product where one team will be mapped to gold, another team will be mapped to silver and another team will be mapped to bronze. So it's not necessary for functions to be defined between real numbers and real numbers or other type of numbers, any objects which can be put together in a set can be used to define functions. If we had defined Cartesian product between B and A, which is medals and teams and a possible function in that case would be with a domain set of three medals and range set of three teams which did win those medals. And then this function will map gold medal to a team, silver medal to another team and bronze medal to the third team. Let's look at slightly different example and again from the Olympics games. Let's replace hockey with boxing and again assume that there are 16 teams who are going to compete in a certain weight class like heavyweight or featherweight or whatever. So pick a weight class and assume there will be 16 countries sending their athletes to fight in that weight class for gold, silver and bronze medals. In this case, all possible combinations of Cartesian products will be again 48 because there are 16 teams and there are three medals. And a possible function will be a function which maps a team to the medal. So how many teams will be in the domain set? If you know a little bit about boxing, you should have said four, because in boxing, everyone who reaches semi-final gets a medal. So the two boxers who lost semi-finals get bronze, and the winner of the final gets gold and the loser of the final gets silver. So there are four medals, a gold, a silver and two bronze medals. So domain set will be four teams 
वन विल गेट गोल्ड सेकेंड सिल्वर एंड टू विल गेट ब्रॉन्ज बट इट इज स्टिल अ फंक्शन बिकॉज इफ यू नो विच टीम डिड विन अ मेडल बाई नोइंग द टीम यू कैन टेल विच मेडल इट वॉन्ट इफ वी लुक एट द अदर कार्टिसन प्रोडक्ट वेयर वी टेक फर्स्ट द मेडल एंड देन द टीम देन अगेन दिस विल बी अ पॉसिबल फोर्टी एट कम्बिनेशन फोर्टी एट पेयर्स एंड इफ वी लुक एट अ फंक्शन विच मैप्स अ मेडल टू इट्स टीम इट विल नॉट बी अ फंक्शन इट विल बी अ रिलेशन बिकॉज यू कैन मैप गोल्ड टू वन टीम सिल्वर टू वन टीम बट फॉर ब्रॉन्ज देर विल बी टू टीम्स फॉर अ फंक्शन अ डोमेन एलिमेंट शुड गेट मैप टू अ यूनिक रेंज एलिमेंट सो फॉर बॉक्सिंग इफ यू आर लुकिंग एट अ मैपिंग बिटवीन टीम टू द मेडल इट वन देन यू आर लुकिंग एट अ फंक्शन बट इफ यू आर लुकिंग एट अ मेडल एंड द टीम विच वन दैट मेडल यू आर लुकिंग एट अ रिलेशन आई होप विद दिस एग्जाम्पल यू हैव अ क्लियर आइडिया ऑफ वट अ फंक्शन इज टू कंक्लूड आवर डिस्कशन अबाउट फंक्शन लेट्स टॉक अबाउट टू लास्ट थिंग्स अबाउट फंक्शन कैसकेडिंग ऑफ फंक्शन एंड इनवर्स फंक्शन एज यू नो अ फंक्शन मैप्स एलिमेंट्स ऑफ वन सेट टू एलिमेंट्स ऑफ अनदर सेट इट्स पॉसिबल दैट देर इज अ थर्ड सेट एंड अनदर फंक्शन विच मैप्स एलिमेंट्स ऑफ सेकेंड सेट टू द एलिमेंट्स ऑफ थर्ड सेट देन इट्स पॉसिबल टू हैव अ फंक्शन विच कम्बाइंस दीज टू मैपिंग्स दिस थर्ड फंक्शन टेक्स एलिमेंट्स ऑफ फर्स्ट सेट एंड मैप्स दैम डायरेक्टली टू एलिमेंट्स ऑफ थर्ड सेट फॉर एग्जाम्पल सपोज द फर्स्ट फंक्शन इज बिटवीन आर एंड आर इट मैप्स रियल नंबर्स टू रियल नंबर्स अंडर इक्वेशन वाई इज इक्वल टू एक्स स्क्वेयर सो इट टेक्स अ नंबर फ्रॉम द फर्स्ट सेट एंड गिवज यू स्क्वेयर ऑफ द नंबर एंड द सेकेंड मैपिंग इज अ मैपिंग विच टेक्स अ नंबर फ्रॉम सेकेंड सेट विच इज रियल नंबर एंड गिवज यू साइन ऑफ दैट नंबर एंड एज यू नो साइन ऑफ अ नंबर इज ऑलवेज बिटवीन माइनस वन एंड वन सो द सेकेंड फंक्शन टेक्स अ रियल नंबर एनी रियल नंबर एंड मैप्स इट टू इंटरवल माइनस वन टू वन देन अ थर्ड फंक्शन कैन बी डिफाइंड which takes a number from the first set squares it and finds its sign so this combined cascaded function will be z is equal to sin of x square if the first function was y is equal to x square and second function was z is equal to sin y then the third function is z is equal to sin of x square it takes x squares it then take sign and gives you a number which is in the interval minus 1 to 1 the last thing that we want to talk about functions is inverse of a function or reverse mapping we already talked about that when we talked about teams getting mapped to medals or medals getting mapped to teams so if there is a function which maps elements of one set to another and there is another function which maps elements of the second set to the first and the cascading of two functions is such that this element gets mapped to itself then one function is called inverse of the other you use one function to go from here to here and you use the other function which is inverse of this first function to come back to the same point similarly if you come from this point start from this point and use the second function to come here then you can use the first function to go back to exactly the same point so two functions are called inverse of each other or reverse mappings of each other if the cascading of the two maps an element to itself now that we have covered basics of mathematical tools that we will need to analyze unpredictable events let's go ahead and start talking about probability theory the mathematical theory used to analyze unpredictable events probability theory is used to make meaningful decisions regarding unpredictable phenomena around us 
And when we encounter a situation where the outcome is going to be unpredictable, we make our decision based on our past experience of similar events. This will be clear when we look at this interesting example. Suppose you are watching a cricket match and two of Pakistan's famous batsmen, Muhammad Yusuf and Inzmamul Haq are batting. Then what will happen after the next ball? It's an unpredictable event. Nobody knows. There are many possible outcomes and we can make a prediction, a declaration, a reasonable guess of what's going to happen after the next ball based on our experience of watching these two great batsmen playing together. There are many possible outcomes. The next ball could be a dot ball. They could take one run or two or three or Muhammad Yusuf, suppose he is facing the bowler, he can hit a very crafty four or a graceful six or despite prayers of all Muslims of Pakistan, one of them will get out. And we'll look at a particular way of getting out, the favorite of these batsmen getting run out. So what will happen after the next ball? It's an unpredictable event and we can make an assumption on the outcomes by ranking them in the order of most likely to least likely and then make a decision based on our preference of most likely event or least likely event. So based on our perception of these two great batsmen, we can say that the most likely event after the next ball will be that one of them will get run out. And what will be the least likely event? It will be that Yusuf will hit the ball, it will not go outside the boundary and Yusuf and Inzmam will run between the wickets and make three runs. That is highly unlikely and you know why. So real life situations where outcome is unpredictable, we deal with such real life situations based on our experience of the past situations which were similar to that. But we usually use mathematical tools to analyze these unpredictable situations. And the mathematical tools that we use are heavily dependent upon the set theory and the related ideas we covered in previous lectures. So let's move to the formal way of analyzing unpredictable events using probability theory. We start the mathematical analysis of unpredictable events by taking all possible outcomes and putting them in a set. This set is called sample space and this contains as its elements all possible outcomes of an unpredictable event. This sample space is also sometimes denoted by capital Greek letter omega. So this is a set and it contains all possible outcomes. Then we take its power set. We look at all possible subsets of sample space and this collection is called sigma field and we make sigma field as domain of a function and this function is probability with the domain as sigma field which contains subsets of all possible outcomes. So with this domain the probability is a mapping a function which maps these subsets to numbers and the numbers must lie between 0 and 1 inclusive of 0 and 1. So for the last example of Yusuf and Inzamam batting, the sample space S or capital Omega consists of all possible outcomes of the next ball. There can be many outcomes. For example, 
Yusuf will leave the ball to let it go to the keeper or he may try to play it but will get beaten and the ball will eventually go to the keeper or it may be a bouncer and Yusuf will duck and the ball will go to a keeper. But if we collect all these outcomes in terms of the result, the scores, then it's either a dot ball, 1, 2, 3 or a 4. It's possible to have 5 scores as the outcome of the next ball if the ball happens to hit a helmet placed behind the keeper or it could be a 6 and then it could be a leg by, a wide ball, a no ball or they can get out and they can get out different ways, bold, stump, run out. All these possible outcomes form our sample space and all possible subset of this sample space are our domains. This is domain and all elements of domain are subsets of sample space and the probability assigns numbers between 0 and 1 to these subsets. Please note that individual outcomes like getting a one run or getting out are also event. Definitely they are events because they are subsets of the sample space. So you can assign probabilities to these events and then you can make different assumptions, different predictions, different declarations, different decisions regarding what is going to happen as the outcome of next ball. For example, you can assign a number 0 0.08 to the outcome that Yusuf or Inzimam will get run out. And you can assign a smaller number say 0 0.02 to the outcome that they will score three runs by running between the wickets, particularly when this running between the wicket consists of three times moving between wickets which are 66 yards apart. So a total of approximately 190 plus yards. There are other subsets of sample space which combine different outcomes. For example, one subset will be the combination of all possible ways that a batsman can get out and if uh, the outcome of the next ball is that the batsman gets out, doesn't matter which method he selects to get out, if he gets out we will say that that event has occurred. And similarly another subset of sample space will be where batsmen get either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or 6 runs and if the outcome of the next ball is that they do get some runs, doesn't matter how many, then we say they got some runs and that event has occurred. And we can assign probabilities to individual outcomes or events which are combination of individual outcomes. I have used word event here as subset of sample space. This usage is quite precise mathematically. Previously we have been talking about unpredictable event which was a synonym with unpredictable phenomena, unpredictable happenings, random experiment. But the word event when used in mathematical theory of probability is defined in precisely mathematical sense that it is any subset of the sample space. So what is probability theory? It analyzes an unpredictable phenomena by taking all possible outcomes and putting them in a set and calling it a sample space. Then looking at different subsets of this sample space and assigning numbers to these subsets. And how do you assign numbers? It's not random. It is intuitive but it is mathematically precise also. So they are assigned according to well-defined axioms of probability theory. 
Before we go on to the axioms of probability theory, let me say something about the sigma field. If the sample space is finite, for example, the sample space which is the outcome of the next delivery in a game of cricket, then the sigma field is actually the power set of the sample space, all possible subsets of the sample space. So if we have a finite sample space, then its sigma field is its power set. If the sample space is countably infinite, even then the sigma field is its power set. But if the sample space happens to be uncountably infinite, then we cannot put every possible subset of uncountably infinite sample space in the domain of probability function. We only put those subsets of uncountably infinite sample space which are nice. Nice in the sense that they follow certain rules which are called rules for sigma algebras and you can look up all those rules in an advanced textbook of probability theory. So, for finite and countably infinite sample spaces, we take all possible subsets and assign probabilities to them. And for uncountably infinite sample spaces, we take those subsets which are meaningful, well behaved and assign probabilities to them. When we assign probabilities to subsets of sample space, this assignment should follow certain rules. These rules are called axioms of probability. What is an axiom? Axiom is a piece of information which is assumed to be true without asking for any proof of its truth. In human endeavor, many fields, many domains are based on axioms, a set of truths that need no proof. For example, all religions are based on a few axioms which form important pillar of a religion called faith. Similarly, in a democratic government, it is assumed to be true that the right to govern rests with the people themselves. They select their representatives and these representatives form a government which runs the affairs of the state. And the constitution is assumed to be the supreme guiding document which assigns and limits the sovereignties of different elements of the state. In probability theory, there are three axioms or truths that must be followed while dealing with unpredictable events. Let's look at these three axioms. The first axiom states that for any event A, which is a subset of the sample space under consideration, the probability of that event is a number which is larger than or equal to zero. I said a little while ago that when you assign probabilities to events, you assign them a number between 0 and 1. But this axiom, the first axiom just says this, that the number should be a positive number larger than or equal to 0. It does not set a higher limit for this assignment. This is done in the second axiom. The second axiom states that if the event is the whole sample space itself, then you must assign a probability of 1 to this event. It's not very intuitive to talk about an event which is the whole sample space, but if you look carefully and think about it, it's not very hard. You see, an event is a subset of sample space and the sample space itself is a subset of sample space. So when you are interested in assigning probability to an event which is the whole sample space, 
then you are saying that this event will occur no matter what happens because all outcomes are in the event. In other words, you are saying something happened. Whatever happened, happened, but your event occurs no matter what is the outcome of the unpredictable event. In the context of the outcome in the game of cricket, you will say that the outcome is something. It could be a dot ball, few runs scored, batsman getting out. You will just say the ball was delivered, something happened and this event should be assigned a probability of 1 because this event always occurs. This event is that ball was delivered, something did happen. So the second axiom says that the largest possible subset of sample space, the sample space itself, should be assigned a probability of 1. And this event is the most likely event. No matter what the outcome, this event always occurs. So you assign probability of 1 to the largest possible subset of sample space. So this second axiom sets the upper limit for probability assignments. The third axiom binds the two axioms together. It states that if there are two events and they are mutually exclusive, that is there is no outcome which is common to two events, then if you form a third event which is union of the two events, that is the outcomes of first event and the outcomes of second events are combined to make the third event, then probability of this third combined bigger event is equal to sum of probabilities of the two events whose outcomes were combined to form the third event. You can use these three axioms to analyze unpredictable phenomena in a precise mathematical sense. And these three axioms can be extended to form other basic interesting results that enable you to make meaningful mathematical decisions about unpredictable events. The three axioms of probability can be extended to come up with interesting results that can be used to analyze unpredictable events. In the next slide, we are going to look at three such results. There are many more and you can look into your class handouts or any standard textbook on probability theory to see them. The first result says that for an empty event, the probability should be zero. What is an empty event? An empty event is an event which does not contain any outcome. So if there are a few possible outcomes of an experiment, a random unpredictable phenomena, then this empty event does not contain any of them. This never happens. If experiment is performed, some outcome is realized, but it cannot be part of the empty event because empty event does not contain any element of the sample space. So this never happens. So for an event which never happens, you should assign a probability of zero. This result can be easily derived from the two axioms of probability theory, the second and third. You see, take one event to be the whole sample space and take the other event to be the empty event. They are disjoint because their intersection is still an empty event. And you should assign probability to these two events in such a way that probability of their union is equal to sum of probabilities of the two events. And because the union is sample space itself and one element of this union is the sample space, then the second element, the empty set, must be assigned a probability of 0.
The second result says that for an event A, if you know its probability, then probability of its complement is 1 minus the probability of the given event A. This also follows from axiom 2 and axiom 3 of probability theory. Once again, there are two events A and A complement. They are disjoint and their union is the whole sample space. And the probability of A plus the probability of A complement should be equal to probability of their union which is the whole sample space which is 1. Hence, if you know probability of an event and you want to find the probability of its complement, the probability of the complement of event is 1 minus the probability of the event whose probability you know. And the last result that I have on this slide is that for two events which are not disjoint, which have some common elements, the probability of their union is less than the sum of the probabilities of two sets that are used to form the union. And precisely, this probability is sum of the two probabilities minus the probability of that event which is intersection of the two events. So, for two events which are disjoint, this also holds true and in that case, probability of A intersection B which happens to be an empty set is 0 and probability of union of two sets is equal to the sum of probabilities of two set which is equivalent to axiom 3. Let's apply these mathematical techniques to analyze a few random real life phenomena. The first example that we are going to discuss is the tossing of a coin. This is an unpredictable event as we all know and the two possible outcomes are head or tail. So, the sample space has just two elements head and tail. So, let us call these outcomes omega 1 and omega 2. Then the sample space capital omega or S has just two elements omega 1 and omega 2 and its sigma field or all possible subset contains four elements empty set omega 1, omega 2 and the whole sample space omega 1 and omega 2 combined. In this sigma field only two events are meaningful which are the events of either head turning up or the tail turning up. These type of events which contain only one outcome are called singleton type events. For a coin toss, only interesting events are singleton type, one being that head comes up and the other being the tail come up. What should be the probability that we assign to these two singleton type events? If you assume that the coin is a fair coin, that is it does not prefer head over tail or otherwise, then you should assign probabilities of 0.5 and 0.5 to both events, the events being the head comes up or the tail comes up. So, equal probabilities imply that the two events are equally likely. The random experiment will not prefer one event to the other. Let us look at the next example. A similar example which is rolling of a dice. A dice is a small cube with six flat sides and on each side there are dots 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 dots and you roll it and it rests with either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or 6 dot on the topmost surface. This is a random experiment the outcome cannot be predicted and this random experiment is used in gambling and playing Ludo and other games of chance. So, what is its sample space? Its sample space is the set of all possible outcomes. Let us call this sample space capital 
omega to contain six elements omega 1 omega 2 omega 3 omega 4 5 and 6 what about its sigma field since it's a finite set its sigma field will contain all possible subsets of this sample space which will include singletons the events like the top face had two dots or the top face had six dots and it will also include complex events like the outcome was an even number of dots or the outcome was odd number of dots or the outcome was anything but six all these interesting singleton type or complex outcomes complex events can be assigned probabilities so what should be the probability assigned to the singleton type elements if you assume that the dice is a fair one you can assign probabilities of 1 over 6 to each singleton type event and if a complex event is there which contains more than one outcomes like the event of the top face had even number of dots then that event contains the outcomes omega 2 omega 4 and omega 6 then the probability of that complex event can be computed from the axioms of probability which states that the sum of probabilities is what the probability of union of disjoint events is so if you assume the dice to be fair you can assign a probability of 1 over 6 to all singleton type events and probability of complex events can be derived from this number but the question is is a dice fair particularly the dice that you see in everyday use the cheap kind where you take a small cube of plastic and dig a few pits on each side and then you color those pits with a black color a color different from the material of that dice so to mark one you dig a small pit in the center of the face and color it and to mark six you dig six pits and color them you see by digging pits you have made this cube asymmetrical and the side which has six little pits is lighter and the side with one pit is heavier so the center of gravity of a regular dice has shifted towards one and it's possible that when you roll this dice it will prefer to come up with six on its top there was an interesting experiment conducted in 1960 by an american named willard h longcor where he took an ordinary dice and rolled it one million times actually he took multiple dice because during the process of rolling the dice was supposed to get worn out so after a few thousand tries he would use a similar but different dice so he rolled the dice for one million times and counted the number of times one two three four five or six came up and the results are shown in this slide so as you can see in this slide that the number one came up so many times that it translated in a probability of 0 0.155 which is less than 0 0.166 which is equal to 1 over 6 the probability if we had assumed that the dice was fair so coming up of number one was less likely than coming up of number six which came up with a relative frequency of such number that the probability was 0 0.179 so as you can see in this slide that these six numbers are different and they are indicative of the relative likelihood of different numbers coming up in a roll of ordinary dice with pits on its faces so what do the 
high quality gambling houses do when they have to use dice for their gambling operations like uh, baccarat or other gambling games they take a piece of plastic and dig six pits but instead of leaving those pits as they are they take the same type of plastic with same density but different color and fill those pits with that plastic so if you hold a professionally made high quality dice then if you put your hand on a surface it will be smooth but it will have six markings so all these things are interesting things and they can be analyzed using mathematical theory of probability the last example that we are going to see and analyze using set theoretic probability theory is the example we have been discussing of the outcome in the game of cricket so what is the sample space once again it is a set of all possible outcomes and you can arrange these outcomes as singleton events which are grouped together in terms of the result that they produce so one singleton event is that it was a dot ball the second is that it was a single run scored through running between the wickets and there are other events that we talked about all the outcomes are singleton type events and the complex events are formed by combining these singleton type events for example a complex event would be that the batsman ran out and you know batsman can run out in different ways but if you combine all outcomes all possible outcomes where a batsman can run out you have a complex event and you can find the probability of that event by combining the probabilities of all singleton type events which are put together to form this complex event similarly another complex event would be that the batsman did score some runs and this complex event is union of those singleton type events where they scored one run 2 3 4 5 or 6 runs so this sample space is finite its power set is again finite and this is not very difficult to be analyzed using probability theory so to summarize what we have covered today we have covered how to use mathematical tools of set theory relations and functions to analyze unpredictable events through three axioms of probability theory and these axioms dictate that you take a random phenomena a random experiment unpredictable event and put all its outcomes in a set that set is sample space from that sample space you form its subsets and call them events and then assign probabilities to these events and these assignments should be meaningful should follow the rules which are called axioms of probability and these assignments must assign to every event a number between 0 and 1 and events which are less likely get assigned a smaller number and events which are more likely get assigned a larger number and this number is always between 0 and 1 the least likely event the empty set gets assigned 0 and the most likely event the sample space itself get assigned a number 1 using these principles these axioms and derived results you can take any unpredictable event form its sample space its sigma algebra and assign it probabilities and this is how we are going to analyze different scientific and real life problems in coming lectures thank you